Hello, good evening everyone. My name is Maddie Sherbondi and I'm a summer program assistant here at the Fine Arts Work Center. Most of you are here because you're participating in one of our amazing summer workshops and you already know what's going on tonight. But for those of you who aren't, for nine weeks every summer, the Work Center hosts week-long open enrollment visual arts and writing workshops. If anyone here is interested in learning more, you can ask me or any of the staff on hand after this event. Staff, please wave your hands. <laughs> if you're here longer than this week, you should think about taking one of our workshops. I promise you would not regret it. One of our favorite parts of our summer programs is that every week our world-class faculty mesmerize our audiences with presentations and talks. Tonight we're going to hear from two faculty members, both visual artists. Nancy McCarthy and Vicki Tomeko will make presentations, which will then be followed by a Q&A with the audience. Before we begin, a bit of housekeeping and other items of interest. Books by this year's faculty will be for sale in our bookstore in the gallery and at the back of the room, as well as some very pretty Falk merchandise, so be sure to check it out. The new Hudson D. Walker Gallery will be open after the event. Right now, we're showing an amazing exhibit called Density's Glitch, which features work by former Falk fellows. The proceeds of all work sold will go to support Fox programs, so be sure to check it out after the event. I'd also like to give a big shout out to our partners who've been so generous. They include Relish, who provided us with our yummy breakfast treats all week, Cosmos, who provided our delicious box meals on our first night, and East End Books, who have helped us stock and set up our bookstore. Restrooms are located down this hallway behind you. And finally, please do us all a favor and turn your cell phones to silent. We will begin with visual artist Nancy McCarthy, a new member of the faculty here at the Work Center, who's teaching a course this week called The Power of Color. Nancy is a painter who works both from imagination and observation. Her upcoming shows include For the Love of Chardin at the Miller Art Museum and the First Street Gallery in New York City. Her awards include a residency at the Inside Out Museum in Beijing, China, a St. Botolph Foundation Award, an artist grant at the Vermont Studio Center, and a Ragdale Foundation Fellowship. She serves as a mentor in both Mass Arts and Lesley University's low residency MFA programs and has taught painting, drawing, and color courses at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design since 2005. In 2018, she was a visiting artist at the Beijing Royal Academy in Beijing, China. McCarthy's work derives from objects in the landscape around her or from her imagination, and she's described her work as, quote, articulations of what is observed outside and how it reflects what is inside. Please give a warm Falk welcome to Nancy McCarthy. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, thank you to Sarah and David and everyone here who's been so welcoming and helpful and just making everything run so smoothly. And hopefully I'll make things run smoothly um, momentarily. It takes a while for this thing to load, so. Um, there we go. What's that? Oh, right, right, thank you. That'll help you guys to hear me. <clears throat> uh, isn't you? I think it's good, Sarah. Okay. So I am showing um, some paintings, images of some paintings, and I've divided them into three categories. And these are the categories I typically work in, landscape, abstract work, and still life. And I've organized them somewhat chronologically. This is, um, I'll start with landscape, and this is a copy of one of my earliest landscape paintings that I have a record of. It's small 10 inch by 10 inch oil on birch panel, and it's from around 1998. I typically paint outside from April to November, but I also have a second body of work always going on in the studio for rain days or days when it's just too hot. Anyone who paints outside knows the infinite challenges the light changes constantly. 
Sometimes there are black flies or mosquitoes. A wind can suddenly send your easel to the ground. <laughs> or worse yet, the palette full of paint gets flown in, or sent into your face. Or rain, raindrops begin as soon as you've carried your gear out to the perfect spot. I can go on and on. But despite all that, I am drawn to painting outside. There is an abundance of energy. I am absorbing all of this energy, and hopefully, sometimes, it's getting into the work. This painting and the next few are all oil on panel, about 12 inches by 12 inches. I work on a variety of sizes and surfaces. This is a small um, painting, five inches by seven inches. It's a one sitting pa painting on carton board. And thank you to my students who've come tonight too. I forgot to say thank you. And um, you guys have been working on some carton board, it's just basically uh, resin treated cardboard. This next, this and the next few are between 26 and 30 inches on canvas or linen, created in several sittings. Sometimes I'm attracted to the dense chaos of the natural world. It's similar to untangling a giant knot of string. I find a thread, then lose it, and then pick up another. It's a meditative process. There is another aspect of painting in the natural world that is significant for me, and that is memory. When I think back over the past, there are many hours that I can recall very little of. But I can recall the distinct sounds, the particular weather, and the smells that were present when I made a painting outside. It's about being truly there. Trees have always been a go-to subject for me and for many artists. They can be a stand-in for the figure. I believe that trees do have sensation and are sentient. This, of course, is part of the belief system of many cultures, particularly of indigenous cultures of the Americas. The next few paintings are on paper and made with acrylic gouache or watercolor. When I travel, if there's any chance of having time outside to paint, I bring water-based mediums to work with. As mentioned earlier, painting holds images in my memory like nothing else, so they're a great way for recording travel. These are from Arizona. These were made in Italy in July, where the acrylic gouache dried as soon as it was out of the tube. And these are not from travel, but from around my home. I live in Rehoboth, Mass, a small rural town near Providence, Rhode Island. Moving back to oil paintings. These are on um, stretch linen or canvas. A few are on panel. And these are all made around my home. The artist Joan Erdley said, the more you know something, the more you can get out of it, and the more it gives to you. The artist Charles Birchfield said, 
As an artist grows older, he has to learn to establish the same relation to nature as an adult as he had when a child. It is with that sentiment I attempt to approach all of my work. The next few are some recent paintings. These are all five inches by seven inches. One sitting paintings, usually completed within three hours, and they're oil on aluminum flashing. And then transitioning into some abstract work. These are oil on panel, about 18 inches. These were made in response to a trip to <coughs> Russia. This painting is a response to a painting by Uccello that was in the Hermitage, 15th century painter and mathematician. And these paintings are transcriptions of paintings by Tiepolo. This is a detail from a transcription from Dehim. The next group are um, paintings made with acrylic wash. And um, when I begin a painting session, I sometimes do an I Ching throw. And for those not familiar with I Ching, it's a ancient giant Chinese divination system with 64 potential responses. And I do a translation in paint to the response. And it's a way of just letting me get into color and shape. They're meant to be fast studies, but very often they go on for a couple of days. And this is same thing, ink wash response to an I Ching throw. And this as well. And just before I go on with my own work, I want to acknowledge how important it is for me to look at paintings from all eras and cultures. And this is just a really tiny, tiny few. These are all in the landscape world. Uh, Albert Pinkham Ryder, American painter. Marsden Hartley, early 20th century American painter. Worth, worked both from the landscape and abstractly. Lois Dodd, contemporary landscape painter who is now in her 90s and still painting away in a great inspiration. Sylvia Plimack Mangold, who was my mentor in graduate school. Sylvia said, I have a criterion which requires my subject to have a precision which says, I am a particular tree, or this is a real location. I love the, this idea that correctness in nature brings about another dimension to the painting. At once abstract and specific, a line that speaks in the particular and alludes to a lot more. Stanley Lewis, 
American contemporary landscape painter, currently has a show up at the Betty Cunningham Gallery in New York. Anyway, that's just a fraction of some of the people I'm looking at a lot. This last group of paintings are still life. Um, first few include objects within the landscape. It's a series of table paintings, all between 24 and 28 inches. This painting and the next is and the next are based on an exercise I have students in color classes do. The first is a response to the setup with the lights on. And this is with the lights turned off. In still life, I'm describing forms and space that may elicit a visceral response from the viewer. Visceral response from the viewer. I'm less interested in what the particular items are, but instead the impact particular shapes and surfaces have when juxtaposed together. Some of the work I'm showing tonight is on view at the Larkin Gallery at 450 Commercial Street in Provincetown. This is a rock self-portrait. I'll end with a few paintings of my garden. I think of gardening as really similar to painting. I'm never sure what will germinate what will suffer from blight, what will thrive. <laughs> I try not to control or correct the unexpected, but accept, appreciate that I can do it and put one foot in front of the other and just move on. Thank you. Was wonderful. <clears throat> um, yeah, marvelous. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to hear from pr now we're going to hear from printmaker extraordinary Vicky Tomeko, who is teaching a course this week on silkscreen printmaking. Vicky lives in Truro and has been a part of the faculty here at Hawk Falk for a long time. She was a Falk Fellow in 1985 and 1986, and is a member of the Visual Arts Committee that chooses the Visual Arts Fellows. <clears throat> she manages the print shop for the Fine Arts Work Center during the seven-month fellowship program, doing workshops and facilitating projects and working to maintain and improve the printmaking experience. Uh, the recipient of two Ford Foundation grants, Vicki works with a variety of techniques to create one-of-a-kind prints full of color, whimsy, and spirit. Her work has been described as appealing, delightful, and always open to experimentation. She also teaches silkscreen at, Cape, silkscreen at Cape Cod Community College, and her work can be seen at Schoolhouse Gallery in Provincetown, the AIR Gallery in Brooklyn, New York. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Vicki Tomeko. I'm not Vicki.
which one is it? Uh, box talk. It's on my twenty two. Okay, well, <clears throat> thank you all for coming. I, I didn't think anyone would be here because I, be, it's the summer solstice, so I thought everyone would be out frolicking in some pagan ritual. Um, but it, <laughs> maybe, maybe that's this, I don't know. But anyhow, um, thank you all for coming and thank you everyone for organizing this and making the work center so terrific. Um, so. Most of you have probably already seen some of my work if you have used um, the bathrooms in the hallway. Um, the smallest bathroom has some, um, uh, I was asked in the, in the winter time if I would paper one of the walls in the bathroom to kind of spruce them up. So I did silk screen a repeating pattern. So it's the black and white bathroom and it's um, very whimsical. It's full of like, um, small pumpkins and um, caterpillars and electrical cords, of course. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's sort of, and I did print them right here in the print shop um, and used the facilities to, to make that work. Okay, so I remember I pushed this one, right? Okay, so I decided to just show you um, work from the last couple of years, but um, in order to sort of introduce that, I thought I would show one piece that's a little bit older. So this piece is called um, The World Was Moving, and it's about six years old. And what happens when I work mostly on um, prints, and most of them are one of a kind, is that uh, I get inspired by one idea, and then I develop a series, and I just kind of get stuck on that and keep working with the same idea for uh, until I've exhausted it. So Bob Bailey, um, who works here on the staff at the Fine Arts Work Center, invited me to be in a show um, called Rainbow. <laughs> and I got into just making all these sort of rainbow images. And this is a, this print is not very large. It's really about um, 15 by 11 inches. Um, and it's, it's a mono print, but made with um, oil-based inks some lithography um, and a lot of stencils and kind of complicated imagery. This print is um, a demonstration I did the last time I taught silkscreen here, so that would have been in 2019. And I thought I would show that because it just, it feels, um, I don't know, I like looking back at work and, and thinking about when it was made and how it came out of the experience of, of being somewhere. In um, one of the things I love about the print shop is that it's communal um, and that everybody kind of, you have to work together and, and you have to get along. Um, but, I, but I love the energy that is generated by a bunch of people working together with similar ideas or on similar kinds of projects. Um, so this piece is called, um, garden groomed, and it's basically all silk screen. So this next series of prints I'm gonna show you are mono prints, um, meaning that they're one of a kind works on paper, and all of them are 26 by 20 inches. And I got stuck on the idea of um, rolling up plates with black ink and then figuring out different ways to subtract black. So using solvents, using rags, using fingertips, uh, pushing things into it, just making different sorts of marks and seeing what can develop and then working on top of that black and white with, with vibrant color again. So this piece is called Spray and it's gonna be, it will be in a show in Brooklyn uh, for the month of July.
this is a brand new piece, and it might not even be done, but I thought I would just show you kind of things I'm working on. And this is called, um, right now, it's called Daisy. Um, one of the rules I have in the prints that I make is that I always want you to be able to see the paper um, and the original white of the paper in many cases. Uh, so this, I broke the rule with this one because I've pretty much gotten rid of all the white. Um, and I think it might not be done. I was looking at the slides before I came this evening and I'm thinking that those sort of puffy, bally shapes um, uh, in the corner of that print might need to be a little more three-dimensional. So I think this one's gonna go back um, to the print shop and get, get um, fixed. So I make a lot of the prints here at the Fine Arts Work Center, but I also have a print shop at home. Um, this piece I'm also not sure is done. It's called um, Geranium. Uh, and again, it's made the same way with the black um, and subtractive, starting out as a subtractive kind of um, working method and then adding colors and on top. And I don't really have any other rules other than that idea that some, some of the white should be preserved. So I don't feel um, obligated to only use printmaking methods. So sometimes I'll just use um, a brayer directly on the paper rather than having it go through the press or putting it on a plate. I try to just work on things as, as directly as possible. This is a piece called Dogwood. Um, and in this one, it's the same sort of method, methodology in, in the work, but um, in this one, I started to use some stencils. So you can see those sort of hard edge shapes uh, in the centers of some of the flower forms um, were made by inking up paper or cardboard stencils and running them through the press on top of the work. Um, This piece is called Sunflowers. So with this work, I mean, a, a lot of the new work is very much influenced by nature and gardens and walking and um, all that kind of um, environmental surroundings in Truro, but um, I was really interested in just textures too and just seeing what you know, how many different textures can you make with ink? So I try to keep um, the work pretty experimental as I'm working. This piece is called Sedum, um, and somebody in this room actually owns that piece. <laughs> um, and I've seen it hanging above Bruce's fireplace, so. But I, I actually, this is one of my favorite pieces, so I wanted to uh, show it to you. So these are all 26 by 20, smallish. Um, uh, this piece is called Zinnia, and it's kind of the last in the, in the black series. I mean, there are more, but these, this is a selection that I just, you know, that I'm fond of and wanted to share with you. Um, I'm, I like, when I use color um, in, the, in the prints, I oftentimes will put a lot of transparency into the ink so that what is underneath shows through and is not covered up um, by the color. Okay, so this is sort of the beginning of a new series. Uh, this print is probably, um, this is probably 22 by 30 inches and um, um, again, it's dealing a lot with flowers, um, but getting rid of the black background. And this piece is curious because it has a lot of glitter on it. You, it's very hard to see on the image there, but it's covered in glitter. And I, I love using glitter in the work, but um, when I show my work at the Schoolhouse Gallery, it's kind of like, it's not necessarily, um, welcomed to to <laughs> to have like you know it it seems a little kitschy i guess 
Um, but every now and then I cannot help myself. So, um, and this piece has uh, all, all kinds of printmaking in it, including silkscreen, but um, it also has some collage elements. So some things are glued right into, uh, onto the paper. Uh, this is an interesting piece um, that, that is called um, Flowers for Lydia. And um, there was a fellow at the Fine, Fine Arts Works Center a few years back, and her name was Lydia. And she loved making prints in the print shop. And she mixed up a gigantic amount of that turquoise ink. Um, and there, when she left at the end of the fellowship, there was a giant baggie of this color in the print shop. And I felt, well, I hate to throw ink out, but I felt compelled to find as many different ways to use that turquoise as possible. Um, so I have a lot of turquoise work, but I'm only hitting you with this one. Um, and, and it's like a lot of stencil work. So you see the orangey, pinky, um, yellowy stuff is all underneath, and then the turquoise is printed over the top. And then stencils are used to block out uh, and you know to preserve uh, what is underneath. Okay, this is the beginning of a, a larger series. So the works I'm going to show you now are um, 30 by 44 inches, and um, they came about um, because I was asked to do, to do a commission. Um, by someone who wanted a large piece for their home. And um, his stipulation was that it should contain logs, bugs, and flowers. Um, so this whole next series of work has all of that in it, um, plus other stuff. So this piece is completely silkscreen um, and was made uh, just like you know a piece of paper flat on the table and different screens and moving the screens around and printing the patterns and this piece has in it something that we're going to do in class tomorrow this is for my class um, called pochoir it's a french um, method of using stencils um, and it works really well with silk screen but you use stencil brushes and and um, stencils and we've been cutting a lot of stencils in the class so um, and so the pochoir elements are the elements that look um, sort of shaded, a little more three-dimensional rather than completely flat. So I think, I'm hoping the class will enjoy that um, in addition to the silk screen. This piece is called Garden. Okay, and again, it's very, it's large. It's 30 by 44 inches. Um, lots of silk screen, some pochoir in it. Um, this one got kind of dense. <laughs> um, but color, color is kind of my thing. And I like playing like flat shapes um, against space and um, sort of mixing it up in that way. So the, your, the, s the spaces are sometimes ambiguous and can be either quite shallow or um, have some serious depth. This piece is called Metamorphosis, for obvious reasons, the caterpillars. Um, and this is primarily a silkscreen piece as well. The, um, file folder that you see in this corner. <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> I used it as a stencil, so. Um, um, but I love just moving the shapes around. And then, of course, with silkscreen, you can be very precise. And you can, um, you know, everything can be solid and very crisp and clean. Or you can kind of be very more casual with it and let things be gray or have fuzzy edges or, you know, mistakes happen in printmaking all the time. And I like the mistakes. 
This piece is called Summer. Um, it's kind of a, a combination of different kinds of summer. So my son was traveling in um, New Mexico, and he kept sending me these pictures of cactuses. So they cropped up into this piece. Oops. That was 15 minutes. OK. Um, this piece is called Water Bear. And so that little creature sort of nestled in the center of the composition is actually um, a microscopic creature. And the real name for it is a tardigrade. And um, they're very resilient creatures. They live in moist environments. Um, but, but if the place where they're living dries out, um, they just go into sort of a, a resting state. And then if, it, if water is reintroduced, they come alive again. And so they decided to do this experiment with them and um, took them to the space station and exposed them to um, the void. Uh, and then brought them back to Earth and put water in it, and they were all fine, which made me feel really good <laughs> because I was worried that they might not be fine. Um, but this is all silkscreen as well. Um, and this piece is called It Can Happen. The butterflies are actually kind of three-dimensional, like the wings flap up. They're sort of sticking off the paper. This piece is called Light Things. This one is called Picnic. This one is called Small Things, named after the ants, of course. Um, lots of silk screen in this one, too. So when I make a screen, I often will just keep it around for a while and reuse it again and again and again on, on different prints. So some of the images you'll see reappear. And this one is called Desert Rain. And then I just wanted to show you a couple things that I'm thinking about and are not finished. So someone introduced me to the idea of making tunnel books, which are um, sheets of paper cut, cut out uh, with shapes on them and then assembled into a kind of accordion-style book or box. Um, and so I started experimenting with that idea, and this one has a squirrel, a cat, and some puffins in it. Um, but then I was looking at the back side of it, and I like that much better. So I'm going to work with sort of lighting and then um, figure out how to show it from both sides. So um, for this, what I, I'm thinking of doing is to silk screen on the black paper. So one side will be full of color and shape and pattern, and the other side will be like that, more shadowy, just black shapes floating around. And then this is another one, uh, which is completely squirrels. And this is it from the side, the back side. So that's, that's like my new idea that I want to play with after this class is over. Um, and then I just have one last image. Whoop, whoop back. Hmm. It doesn't want to show. Well, that's okay. It's a self-portrait. There it is. Okay. So I teach painting um, at the community college every semester. And one of the things that I love to have the students do is a self-portrait. And so I do two self-portraits every year. And I just have this collection of them. Um, and of course, this is the most recent. So that's all. Thank you very much. Just sit down.
Thank you, Vicki. Another hand for Vicki Tomeko. <clears throat> now we're going to have a little bit of self-directed Q&A. So if you have any questions for Nancy or Vicki, just raise your hands and they will call on you. Sure. Um, a lot of artists are, have been painting on aluminum since the 50s. Um, Lois Dodd, who I mentioned, who's in her 90s painting up in Maine, has been showing a lot of work on flashing. So it's not my idea. The great thing about aluminum flashing is that I get uh, little pieces for about 70 cents at um, my local building supply. So, and you can get larger pieces. And it gives you, you know, it's, it's this um, very brilliant um, surface to set your paint on. So um, it's, a, it's a fun, fun thing. I suggest it. No, no, you don't have to, you don't have to, um, no, well, the paint sits up on it because it's not at all absorbent, but you don't have to gesso it or anything. And it's similar to artists painting on copper and, and other metals over centuries. Hmm. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, um, this part of my person goes dead and the little computers, the perception is what's happening and it's moving. Perception is going and it's coming out my hand. And I think what happens for um, us when we let perception guide us as opposed to you know, it's so hard to switch from what we think and expect and just let perception guide us. Um, what happens is your kind of your natural energy starts to be recorded as well. So you, it's all about perception, but it's also about core stuff that comes out. So I don't know if that makes sense, but I don't know if there's any. I think because I love the paper so much uh, that I don't want to totally lose my first contact with it. Like I, I want everyone to be able to see the originals part of the surface that interested me so much. Um, and and a lot of times when I'm using ink, I'll I'll make it 
so very transparent so that it's almost although it's sometimes oil based or sometimes acrylic based it's also um, transparent enough so that it acts kind of like watercolor where the luminosity of the white paper brings the color you know makes it more vibrant I guess yeah Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what, what you mean by that in relating to another artist. Yeah, yeah. So um, it, it kind of, I don't know how common it is, but it, and it may, I know other artists do transcriptions, so it's certainly not mine, but it was interesting that um, Peter was talking last night about makers switching um, worlds, and my initial um, study as an undergraduate was as a composition major. I was a music major. And it really informs my work. And that's something you do in music. You transcribe from one key to another. Um, so you, you look at a piece for a bassoon and you move it into a piece for on another range like a, a clarinet or a, a flute or something. So um, when I'm doing a painting transcription, I'm looking at what the, other, what the artist do, did and I, I'm thinking in on really basic terms of shape and value, and then I'm putting in some of my other, my, my own response to that. Oh, not for me. Probably for some artists, yeah, but for not, yeah. 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 Those are all the pieces. Pretty much all the pieces I showed you have been made within the last two years. No, I just kind of, you know, what I was just interested in doing something really loose because I had been working really extremely tight with lots of detail and I wanted to do something that would just be freeing. Um, so it was a way, a way to do that really quickly and just have fun with it. Yeah. Neil? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the one that's very orange and pale background on the music for the music for the seminar and board. Mm -hmm. I look at that. Well, since I'm taking your class, I, I have figured out how you've done some of these. <laughs> yeah. But the background, that's why it's very, it's a watercolor paint. It's saturated. And I can't tell. Is, is that like, like how do you? Hmm. It's very tight literary pale, and then it gets orange, and it, it looks like watercolor contrast with more printed foliage. Yeah, so, so Neil owns um, one of, I did a, a 12 month series of uh, different aquariums, one for each month of the year. And I can't remember what the orange one is, but. It's that thing I was talking about where I make the color very, very transparent um, so that the white of the paper makes it kind of glow. And the method I was using there was, I was using oil-based inks to make that piece. And um, the fish are gum transfer. Um, and I think there are little pine needles in that too, right? Like floating around. There's a lot of stuff. There's stuff. Yeah. And, I, and those I think are, so I think it's a, yeah, it's a combination of a lot of different kinds of printmaking. So that one has lithography in it. It has straight monoprint in it, and it has gum transfers, and it might have a little etching in it as well. So I, I just kind of mix it up, but I'm not really interested in making, um, 
a bunch of things that look exactly the same, even though I did that in class this week. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, mm -hmm. well, I, I know I just have to congratulate my class for, tre for, for um, treating um, silkscreen and printmaking kind of like painting, like they're not thinking about rules or following steps and um, making everything fit perfectly. Everybody's experimenting, and I think that's really a good way to learn printmaking, especially f when you only have a week to jump in and do it. So everyone's, yeah, it's been a, a really good class so far. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm attracted to, um, you know, things like science and nature, and and I like to put disparate things together too, like the wallpaper in there. It's, I mean, electrical cords and caterpillars, they have nothing to do with each other really, but I, I like that they can live in the same world. <laughs> I don't know, it's just fun. I like to have fun in my work. I'm not about torturing myself. Um, and humor, humor is part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Yes, um, I I do go back and forth. So like, right now I think I might be done with that series once I finish the two that I realize showing you tonight are not done. <laughs> um, so, but maybe I'll decide I have to make some more of those at some point. So it's yeah, not it's not done until it's done. Yeah. Yes. Of course. Yeah, it, it, they happen simultaneously, typically. Um, and sometimes I get, um, you know, I'll do four or five paintings from observation and I'll just need to do something else. I'll just need to, it's kind of going down. I don't know how to describe it in any other way, but it feels like I'm going down and I'm, I'm not looking out, I'm just responding to the image that I'm making. Yes. Yep. So something uh, that you said that resonated with me. Um, I, I grew up in a garden as a family, and my um, my path led me to be a landscape architect. But as I'm laboring with like as a forty-something-year-old, I began to paint, and I love what you had to say about because I find gardening. Yeah, I think I think probably a lot of us here, a lot of artists are also gardeners. There's a lot of uh, cross currents as well as cooking. I don't know, lots of you probably cook too. Yeah. 
answer the question for you. Uh, where we live, there's a lot of those big old bull pines in the forest. Yeah. And you had some paintings of those, and when I'm walking along them, there are these big masses that all seem to like round with this rough texture thing. Yeah. And the way you use flat surfaces and flat juxtapositions of colors that somehow, from a distance, gave the same feeling of that size, that bulk, and a roundedness to them. It isn't a question, it's a thing <coughs> that really strikes me. Thank you. That sense of something really powerful about the figure, hmm. and that you get it right or you don't, and it's wrong or no, it's wrong. Right. And the paintings of some of those trees have that same feeling. Oh, thanks. It is great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, someone in the back. Yeah. Hi. Uh, it's Linda that answered that someone who hasn't heard it before said that it's sort of mystery rock type type thing. Mm -hmm. that, that, was, that was Vicky. I think Koshwa. Koshwa. P. P O C H O I R. Pochoir. Yeah, it's a stenciling process, so you use a stencil brush and, yeah.